Hi everybody and welcome back to Lost Genre Reddit Stories. This post is from the subreddit Am I the A-hole and it's by user Able1-9985. Am I the a-hole because I call my psycho ex's unrelated child my nodder? Buckle up. 15 years ago, I was 25 and was finishing my contract and my then girlfriend of 3 years, Natalie, was acting increasingly strange. I came back from a 2 month assignment and was prepared to break up with Natalie. She came by and gave me the good news that she was pregnant. I asked how far along she was and she said 5 weeks, so I broke it off with her and told her she needed to do better at math. She refused the breakup and insisted the baby was mine, so I told her the following. 1. Paternity test and 2. If the child was mine, we can talk about financial support and custody arrangements with lawyers. She refused both and told me we both knew that I was a deadbeat for knocking her up and leaving her. I told her I was on a 2 month assignment when she conceived but a few insisted for the sake of decency, I house her and give her limited support. I consulted a lawyer about this mess and the lawyer made it very, very clear that any overt support I give could be seen as me taking responsibility. So I told these friends that and most dropped it, except one guy who again insisted that charity couldn't be used as a legal cudgel like that. The child was born and I'm not even going to do the whole she didn't look like me because most babies are born with squished faces and all I saw were the pics she sent me with messages like Emma wants to know where her daddy is and crap like that. She still refused to take any paternity tests but her constantly showing up with that baby got to the point where I filed for a restraining order. Fun fact, in my state a permanent restraining order is not in fact permanent, it is two effing years long. The only way to get it longer is if there was a violent crime associated and apparently bugging someone with a baby that's not theirs is not a violent crime. So my life for the last 14 years was me renewing the restraining order every two years because once it clears, Natalie shows up again with my not child. I did eventually find a nice girl, get married and now I have a 9 year old son, Henry. My wife Kim is well aware of Natalie and Emma. When the cycle begins again, I always say the same thing. 1. Paternity test. 2. Once paternity is proven, I will take custody and get financial support set up. Natalie always refuses and says both are insulting. Now, recently, the cycle started again and this time Emma showed up first. She approached my son during a school event, visit to the zoo, and said, Hi, I'm your big sister Emma. Henry knows about stranger danger and ran away to a teacher. I had to have a very, very painful talk with the teachers and parents that were at the event about my relationship with Emma and Natalie and how Emma was never my daughter. I even called her my daughter once or twice in the conversation. After the group disbanded, one of the mothers confronted me and said that while Natalie was in the wrong telling this poor child I was her father, calling her my daughter was mocking this situation. I kind of get where she's coming from, it's just that I can't help this child and the honest truth is playing light of the two year cycle is the closest I can get to finding peace in the situation. So am I the a-hole for calling Emma my daughter? Well, OP, I can see where the other mom is coming from, but I don't think you're the a-hole for using that word. The bigger problem here is that Natalie is now using Emma to stalk your son. That's dangerous. Because let's face it, it wasn't serendipitous that Henry was on an outing at the zoo with his class and Emma just shows up and says, hey, I'm your big sister. So my question here is, the fact that Emma and Natalie now are stalking your son and Natalie is using or manipulating her daughter to do an approach, can you use this in any way with the courts to mandate a DNA test regardless of what Natalie says or how much of a tantrum she makes? Or maybe you could also go the CPS route and see if they can help you get a DNA test to clear this whole thing up and finally get Natalie off your back. I mean, I know it could be a long shot, but I think that's the route I'd take. I'd definitely ask my lawyer about it. And what do you guys think about OP's situation? What would you do and what is your judgment? Let me know in the comment section. And now let's check out the community comments to see what they said. 
Loves Karatz says, you could get a court-ordered DNA test. Her claims are slanderous. You could take her to court to prove paternity. And Opie responds, Natalie has long since stopped calling me out for being a deadbeat online. She prefers to show up in person asking if I want to meet our daughter. The last time the cops confronted her about this, she claims that she only wanted me to act as a paternal father figure to her child. It really depends on the cops that show up. Deppled Turnoff 0A says, Not the a-hole. I can understand why someone would think that this is callous, but it's your business and you've every right to use humor to try to deal with it. Don't say that to Emma, considering she believes her mom, that would be pretty rude. Now, the burning question, how did she find Henry while he was on a field trip? And Opie responds, We suspect Natalie befriended a mom at the school and got a class schedule, then dropped Emma off at the zoo to be with her brother. Since we are unrelated, I have no idea what school Emma goes to or who Natalie's friends are. We are being very reactive to the situation, but because there are children involved, my lawyer said that that's the best we can do. And any type of investigation into Natalie beyond where to send legal paperwork could make it seem like mutual contact and hurt any future restraining orders. Chess2202 says, Have you considered reporting your ex to CPS? She is emotionally abusing her daughter. She is telling her that you are her father and don't want her, and she dropped her off at the zoo to find your son and tell him that she is his sister. If you report this along with the constant restraining orders, surely CPS would intervene and at least interview her daughter to find out what else she is being brainwashed with, and interview your ex as a potential danger to both her daughter and your son? The fact that she is following your son should be enough to take further measures. That's what I thought. And Opie responds, Before Emma was involved, we had no idea what type of relationship the two had other than how Emma acted in public very briefly. We had no reason to contact CPS. And again, delving into Natalie's home life with Emma could have been construed as a type of contact, which makes getting a new restraining order much harder. We need to know where to send the summons. That's it. Opie's edit. To answer the repeated question, in my state, the mother has to start the petition for the father to be established and the test to start. There is no instance where a father can start the petition. There was a chance to do this when Emma was born, but the window was exactly one month and I was too much focused on the restraining order, not thinking the paternity angle would bite me in the butt. And one last time, to everyone saying, just ask for custody, that'll force the DNA test, literally can't be done. I've been through this enough with a lawyer and have consulted with other lawyers. There are laws protecting children and a lot of them exist for good reason. I'll explain it the way my lawyer explained it. Imagine there's a woman that ran from an abusive ex. She finds out after she escaped that she's pregnant. She gives birth, never puts the ex on the birth certificate, never tries to file for support because she wants to get as far away from him as possible. He finds out years later and tries to rope her back in using the child as leverage. She can just say no and the state has to let it go. There is, however, a provision. If the father was involved enough to know when the birth was, that he could submit his DNA to the state within 31 days of birth as a potential father, but that time is long past. The law is designed this way on purpose. In the eyes of the family court, I am a random person and I was never claimed to Emma. If you think the state wants all children to be claimed by fathers and will gladly submit any DNA test whenever any potential father shows up, find a random single mom, call the family court and say you want to claim their child. I am tired of everyone acting like all I needed to do was fill out one sheet of paper and this nightmare would end. Please just call a lawyer for a free consultation or post on legal advice and ask them. It doesn't work that way. Okay, so the community agrees that OP is not the a-hole, but they mostly focus on OP's legal issues, which wasn't something that OP was asking about because apparently he's seen a lot of lawyers already and he knows how this whole thing works. So unfortunately, all the advice that the community was giving him on this wasn't going to help him. And he made that pretty clear in his edit. However, he did give us all the necessary updates for us to have closure on this story. So let's move on with the first update to see what happened next. 
Got off the phone with my attorney. We have a preliminary hearing on the new restraining order this week. We will most likely be issued a temporary restraining order and then after that another hearing for the permanent restraining order. CPS is investigating Natalie and Emma's living situation. The teacher's report held a lot of weight and my lawyer thinks that this might actually be a way to end the madness now. In family court, for minors, there exists something that's like a temporary court-appointed guardian. I think the term is guardian ad litem, who is only a guardian for legal purposes and procedures and decisions of such, including for medical. If the family court appoints such for Emma, we can ask this temporary guardian for a DNA test and get this put to ground. The madness might actually have an ending in sight. This bit of harassment with the CPS report and the new restraining order should, if we are lucky, be the kill shot we need. Opie's edit. I feel like I need to explain the relationship I had with Natalie all those years ago. When I got back from my two month assignment, I was already dead set on breaking up with her. Her, oh wait, I'm pregnant, was never going to make me marry her. In fact, I doubted she was pregnant for several weeks. The last year of our relationship, several red flags appeared in her behavior, ranging from demanding I check in with her while at work, only to hang out with friends with her present, extreme bouts of jealousy if I ever seemed too friendly with women, including waitresses. I was in a line of work that demanded me being away for long stints, which she hated, but also kept me out of her reach for long periods of time. I think it was halfway through that last year I realized that when I was away, I did not miss her. In fact, I was relieved to plop into a cot and fall asleep after long hours of work without thinking about her. When the pregnancy turned out to be real, I made it clear that with a paternity test, I would pay support, split custody and be a co-parent and nothing more. She wanted me to be her husband, no questions asked. No test, just pure blind faith and devotion to her and the child. The test, she insisted, was insulting. There was never going to be a relationship and there was no relationship to salvage with Natalie. On the advice of the first attorney I hired, the deal was no test, no contact. Okay, so it sounds like OP has a shot at getting that DNA test. So now let's continue with the next update. The preliminary hearing on the new restraining order went well. Emma and Natalie were there and we discovered that Emma is currently living with her great-grandmother and has a guardian ad litem, court-appointed guardian on legal matters. My lawyer thinks this means whatever was found in Natalie's home situation warranted removing Emma and potentially severe enough that the great-grandmother only has physical custody and the need to appoint a guardian ad litem. During the hearing, we went through the whole song and dance, the past restraining orders, the whole deal. My lawyer turned to Emma's representative and said we were willing to submit to a DNA test and put this to bed. Natalie looked like she was having a conniption at that and her own lawyer urged her to shush. Emma's representative accepted and we were cheek swabbed in the courthouse. A temporary order is now in place while a second hearing is scheduled in the upcoming weeks for the permanent two-year order. The order covers immediate family on both sides and as I've detailed in the past, Natalie is actually good with following court orders, oddly. We have about four weeks before we have the definitive test results back, but I'm not too worried either way. P.S. There was some people who thought the court couldn't use charity as a cudgel who was the father. Well, that's Jim. Haven't talked to Jim in 10 years, but Jim is gay and hated Natalie. He just also happened to be a give the shirt off his back kind of dude and as long as I knew him volunteered at a food pantry. His protests came mostly from naivety, not self-interest. Alright, OP was cheek swabbed and so was Emma. So now let's jump into the future and take a look at the DNA test results and see how this story ends. We got the results in late last week, as did Emma's party. I am not the father. Natalie had a major blow up when she heard the news from her grandmother, Sylvia. Emma's currently living at Sylvia's and is out of Natalie's custody. This blow up included a major tantrum on my front lawn, which also violated the temporary restraining order. 
Natalie has been arrested and Sylvia hasn't bailed her out. Sylvia has communicated to my lawyer that she wanted to give her apologies for bankrolling Natalie's life the past 15 years. I only met Sylvia a few times when I was dating Natalie and I know Natalie grew up with her and Sylvia had money but was never really told the extent of that. Sylvia has communicated via my lawyer, which is technically allowed with the restraining order in place, that both she and Emma want to send me an apology via a letter. I told my lawyer they were free to write whatever letters they wanted, as long as this was the last communication we had with them. The permanent restraining order is certainly going to be granted now, with the emergency one violated. We still don't know what caused Emma to be removed from Natalie's care, or if Natalie has any underlying issues. Well OP, I'm gonna call this a happy update for you and a positive one for Emma, because Natalie was definitely a bad mom. It seems to be that she is in better care with Sylvia and now the whole fog of this thing has been lifted and she can start moving on with her life. I do hope Emma gets the help that she needs because she will definitely need to do some work considering the crappy mom that she had and I hope Sylvia doesn't bail her out anytime soon. So on that note Obi, here's wishing you the best to you and your family in the future. Take care and thank you for sharing. And now let's finish this video with a mood booster post. This post is from the subreddit Malicious Compliance and it's by user Armawa. I guess I'm not at all powerful after all. About 10 years ago, I was working in a big organization with lots of different departments. I was a subject matter expert working across different departments. I saw my job as making the people I worked with lives as simple as possible and my clients loved me for that. Unfortunately, this came back to bite me because they started expecting me to perform miracles. Before I started at this job, someone had decided to split up a department, except they didn't really do it properly, so all the systems still saw the same as a single department. The two department heads despised each other. My solution? Create a workaround in the system I had control over so that they looked separate from each other and no one saw the other area's data. But in every other system, one department looked like it fell under the big one. And if you looked closely at my reports, you could very clearly see the workaround. Department head of the smaller department was really sick of this and asked me to fix it. I explained that the issue was at the organization level. She needed to write to the higher ups and get written authorization to change the official organizational structure. Then, once that was done, the rest of the systems would follow suit. If I changed it in my system, then something would break and she would have bigger problems than just having to ignore a header that I would hide or delete from her reports. She insisted that if I changed the structure in my system, it would start a domino effect and everyone else, who was less helpful than I was, would have to listen to her when she said that she wanted their system changed to mimic mine. I tried to make a joke of it, explaining that I know I look like I'm all powerful because I can get stuff done for her, this was not going to work out that way. She actually needed to deal with the organization bureaucracy BS. Trust me, I can't help with this one. This response only frustrated her more. We went around this for about a year and she finally lost it with me. She called me late one Friday afternoon and told me that I had to make the change or else. I explained again that things would break but she wasn't having it. She cut me off and told me to do as she asked or else. Cue malicious compliance. I asked her to put her request in writing. Always cover your ass. She promptly sent me an email. I responded straight away saying doing this is going to break stuff. We have discussed it before, but since you insist, I'll get the changes sorted as soon as possible. I organized for the change in my system, stopped by my boss's office on my way out to tell him what was happening and to prepare for the fallout. Again, always cover your ass. He chuckled and wished me a good weekend. The change was easily reversible and the problems would be very frustrating, but minor. No one is going to die, so neither of us were too concerned. 11 a.m. Monday. Department head calls me in a huff. Apparently, she wasn't able to see any of her staff in the HR system. I said, that sounds about right. Now that my system and HR don't agree, computers say no. Remember how I told you things would break? This is things breaking. I'm happy to switch my system back, 
she simply hung up on me. Word is, she called the HR person and told her that the only way to get the change she wanted was to follow the process I had been pointing to for the past year. She said that only she had the authority to ask for the change. She spent the rest of the day pulling favors to get the process I told her about months before Fast Tracked. All of this could have happened without anything needing to break. By our next meeting, things had been changed properly. The situation was never mentioned again, but from that day onwards, if I told her that I couldn't do something, she took my word for it. Well, she wanted things done her way and I guess she learned the lesson. Leave it to corporate politics to always make a mess of things. Thanks for sharing, OP. And that's it for today's video. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch it. Now, if you've gotten to this point in the video, I assume that you like these stories that I'm reading out. So here are a couple more that you might enjoy. And if you don't have any time to watch another story right now, save it for later. And also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button.